Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about rejection ABC. This was the maybe first algorithm uh, proposed to deal with the problem that uh, we have. So I'll just remind you what the problem is. Suppose we have intractable likelihood, uh, for example, um, something that is generated by a simulator that we don't really know how to express analytically. So we can sample from the simulator, we can input parameters and get X. So we can get this, uh, we can get the X's by sampling, but we don't know the distribution of X given theta. So how can we still get a sample of the posterior? So this is what rejection ABC will give us. And we will start with a simplified version of it. So the building blocks of the simplified version are an observed data. So let's say you did observe some data and we will denote this by x observed some prior that you assume on the parameter and a simulator that you uh, input theta and it gives you an x simulated and you can do this an unlimited number of times as much as you want so the simplified algorithm says uh, sample theta from the prior okay so just sample from the prior we we know how to sample from the prior the prior has to be something that we can sample from and then use that theta that you sampled to push it to the simulator and let it output an X simulated. And then if X simulated is equal to X observed, then you accept theta as a sample point from the posterior. And otherwise you discard that theta. Okay, so this is why it's called rejection because some of the thetas you will input into the simulator and they will give you an X simulated that is not equal to X observed. And in that case, you will reject them and you will throw them. So let's look at a simplified example. Suppose that theta distributes Bernoulli, it can either be zero or one and both with equal probability. So uh, both have 0 0.5 probability. And suppose that X given theta distributes categorical. So it had, can have three values, one, two, or three. And if theta is equal zero, then the probability of each of each value for x is equal, meaning the probability of x given the theta is equal to zero is one third for any x, x1, x2, and x equal three. But if theta is equal to one, then you have more chance that x is equal to one. You have a 0 0.5 chance that x is equal to one and a quarter and a quarter chance that x is equal to two or three. And this is a very, very simple problem. And you can analytically um, compute the posterior, for example, when x is equal to 1. And in this case, it will be that theta has a 0 0.4 probability of being 0 and a 0 0.6 probability of being 1. I leave the whole computation as an exercise for the viewer. So suppose we didn't know the true posterior and we want to calculate it using the rejection uh, ABC algorithm. So what will be the distribution of the accepted points? Okay, and I'll denote by theta dash that we accepted the theta that was proposed by the prior. So let's start actually with the joint. Let's start with the joint that theta uh, dash is equal to some value and that x simulated is equal to some value. What is the probability of this? Well, it's just the probability that theta, the prior, is equal to some value, and uh, the simulated x is equal to some value, and that we accepted the point, right? And now we can break it down. Right? We can break it down to um, the probability that um, theta is equal to some value times the probability that x simulated is equal to some value given that theta was given was equal to some value times the probability that we accepted the point given that x was equal to some value, and we use um, and we use conditional probabilities here, and the fact that and the fact that this only depends on this, and that this only depends on this. And this is how we can break it down to this. And notice, of course, that the last probability is basically just an indicator function, right? We accept it if x val is equal to x observed, right? To the value at x observed. If not, this will be zero. And now if we moved from the joint to the marginal of only theta dash, 
this only involves going over all the values of x val, right? Of all the values that x simulated as a random variable can have. So we do this. And of course, if we go over this in the simplified algorithm, well, everything will be zero except when x val is equal to x observed. So this will just be equal to this thing over here. Okay, but this is proportional to uh, the posterior, right? The only thing missing here is the evidence. So this is proportional to the posterior. And what it means, it means that the probability of getting some value is proportional to the posterior. But so the samples that you accept are actually from the exact posterior. And we can see this, for example, if x obs is equal to one, then the probability of theta dash equal to zero, meaning that uh, we accepted the point uh, is equal to that the prior is generated zero, the probability that the prior generated zero, and then the probability that we entered zero to the simulator and it outputted one, because we only accept the point if it outputs one, which is x observed. And if we calculate this, it's one six, if we do the same for theta uh, equal to one, it's one fourth. And we see that uh, the sum of it is not one, it's five twelve. And this is because uh, we rejected uh, seven twelve of the samples. This is why it's only proportional to the posterior, okay? But the samples themselves, if we only look at the uh, accepted points, they are from the true posterior. Okay, and maybe we switch into R to see this in code. Okay, so I'm loading this library that allows me to use categorical distribution. And I'm sampling already a bunch of thetas from the prior. Okay, and I'm setting the observed as one. Um, defining a simulator, and it says exactly what I wrote, yeah, that if theta is equal to zero, it has equal probability, and then it just draws one from this categorical distribution with this probability and if it's one then it will give me this probabilities for the different uh, values of x which can be one two or three and then i input all these data to the simulator to get the simulated value and then i only take the in i'm marking the indexes of simulated values that had the same value as the observed value and i only take these indices. i'm rejecting all the other uh parameters and I'm only taking this. And this is the posterior distribution and you can see it's very close to uh, the analytical or the true posterior of 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. One question maybe is how much we accepted or how much we rejected. So we can see that we accepted about 41% of the total number of uh, parameters that we, that we sampled, which is what we expect. We expected to only keep about five out of 12 uh, proportion so let me go back into OneNote. And immediately, you might see a problem uh, in this simplified algorithm. Um, the probability of x sim to be exactly equal to the observed uh, value that we've seen is approaching 0 in more and more complex scenarios. And specifically, if x is continuous, uh, the probability that you will get exactly the same number is uh, in infinitely small. So we need to modify the algorithm somehow that it not only accepts the exact value, but also close enough values. So now the algorithm changes and the building blocks we use uh, change a bit also. So we still need the observed data. And often we will need some summary of that data because it will be too complex, too high dimensional. So we need some uh, summary function that uh, lowers the dimensionality of our uh, data. We still need a prior. We still need a simulator that you input theta into and gives you x simulated. Now we also need a notion of a distance matrix. Yeah, and this sometimes get noted as rho or a norm or d for distance. And we also need a threshold. So we also need this epsilon that we define with it what is close enough. So if the distance is below this threshold, we say it's close enough. And if it's above this threshold, we say it's not close enough. And now the algorithm is more or less the same. You sample from the prior. You use that uh, parameter, uh, you plug it into the simulator, and it gives you an x simulated. 
you can now calculate a summary statistic for that data. So you can take the S function and lower the dimensionality of X simulated. Uh, if it's not a problem, you can leave it uh, that as an identity function, yeah, that SX is equal to X. And now you check if the summary statistic of X sim minus the summary statistic of X observed, if uh, the distance between them is below some threshold, if so, you accept theta to be a point of the posterior, otherwise you reject it. And notice that this algorithm doesn't actually give you an exact posterior, but an approximate posterior, because we are not taking the points that are exactly equal to x observed, we are taking some epsilon ball around it. And because of this, um, you don't get an actual true posterior, you get an approximate posterior. And as epsilon goes to zero, the samples are drawn more and more close to the true posterior, but there's a trade-off. As epsilon goes to zero, the number of rejected samples go up, and the number of accepted go down, so you have to run the algorithm more and more in order for you to collect uh, a decent amount of samples. Now, regarding the summary statistics, this is another difficulty. Uh, we might lose information. So if the summary statistic is sufficient uh, for the parameters that we are uh, looking at, we don't lose information. If it isn't, we lose some information. So um, think of it like this. So, this is what we get when we use the, um, this algorithm. This is the posterior that we get, and it needs to approximate uh, this thing, right? It approximates uh, the posterior of some value given an X observed, the actual data. And if you use a summary statistics, then what it actually approximates is this thing over here. And if the summary statistic is sufficient, what it means, the, the definition of uh, sufficient is that this is equal to this. So if the summary statistic is sufficient, uh, we won't have an extra problem arising from the summary statistics. But if it's not, we lose even more information. OK, so the, the general point to um, stress is that there is some, there is some accuracy efficiency trade-off. Yeah? So if you want higher accuracy, you need to lower your epsilon. It might take you longer to actually get a decent amount of samples that are accepted. If you prefer efficiency, then you need to increase the epsilon, the threshold, uh, but then you might lose some accuracy. So let's see a toy example that I've made. Uh, suppose that X distributes a Gaussian mixture model with uh, something that looks like this, basically. So the same variance, only different means and different mixture components. Suppose that the true parameters are minus five and five. So you have one Gaussian centered around minus five and 75% of the observations go there. And you have one Gaussian centered around five and 25% of the observation goes there. And suppose the prior is also normal uh, with a mean zero and zero and, uh, and a variance matrix, which is 10 times the identity matrix. So in order to do ABC, we have to think of a summary statistic um, after playing a bit with it, I chose to have um, two uh, information points. One is the median and one is the spread, which means um, the 90th percent quantile minus the 10 percent quantile. We also need a distance measure. I just take the regular Euclidean norm. And then we have to decide about the level of threshold. I played with it a bit and I chose three. Notice that all of these are ad hoc decisions that I uh, decided and they depend on the current problem. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at the problem and I'm trying to think about some, the appropriate summary statistic and norm, etc. This is kind of a problem. So um, let's switch back into R. Yeah, so I'm setting up the problem. This is a simulator that I've built. It just does what exactly what I told you. It does a GMM with 75% over the first parameter, 25% over the other parameter. Um, let's run this with the actual true parameters. And you can see the KDE plot. It looks exactly like uh, I showed you before. This is the summary uh, statistic function that I use. Again, I use the median and the spread. OK, this is the prior. 
you can see how it looks. And now let's do ABC. Okay, so I'm, I'm starting with uh, an empty data frame for the posterior data. And then I already sampled the priors here. So I go over them and I feed them one by one to the simulator. Then I calculate the summary statistics for both the simulator uh, and the actual observed data, which is in X. Okay. And I um, calculate the norm of it and I check if it's less than the threshold of three. If so, I accept the point, I add it to the data frame. If not, I just do nothing. Okay, so I do this. Okay, it finished about, it took it about a minute on my uh, laptop. Uh, it accepted around 3.5% of the points. If we now plot the posterior, we see that it seems to be around here somewhere. If we do a KDE plot, maybe we can see it a bit better. Okay, so it looks to be quite accurate. So it, it says for the X seems to be more or less around centered around minus five and the Y is centered around five and the X and Y is just the first mu and the second mu here. So it seems to find a good to center and close in on the true parameter value. And we can also see that the column means are quite close. Okay, minus 4.9 and 4.1, it's not exactly as close as I would want to five, but it's not bad. Okay, so what are the pros and cons of uh, rejection ABC? Well, the pros is of course, you don't have to be able to compute the likelihood. You can just use this method, even if you have an intractable likelihood. And uh, the cons is that it depends on ad hoc decisions. So I had to choose a summary statistics. I had to choose a distance measure. I had to choose a threshold. Uh, this is a general problem for all the ABC methods, also for MCMC and uh, sequential Monte Carlo ABC. Another problem is that it scales poorly to high dimensional data, uh, what is called the curse of dimensionality. So this is a graph from a really great lecture by Professor Scott Sisson. I will link it in the description of this video. Uh, he shows a problem where he generalizes this problem over here to uh, many dimensions, but it keeps it such that uh, the marginal uh, is always um, this thing over here. And then it, it checks um, if you increase the, the number of dimensions from one to two to three to four, how does uh, rejection ABC performs? So you can see in dashed is the true posterior. And already when you only use one dimension, you get something that is not the exact true posterior, but this is good enough, right? Because we are using a threshold. We are not accepting uh, the exact uh, true posterior. We are doing some approximation, and this approximation is considered usually good enough for us. Uh, but notice that if you go to already just two dimensions, this approximation, it's this line over here, it already gets really, really bad. And if you go to three already, it loses the bimodal property that it has, and it looks nothing like the true distribution. So you see that there is a problem with uh, dimensionality. And there is something called regression adjustment that fixes it. And uh, since all the neural density estimators are basically an improvement over this regression adjustment, then they also kind of help a bit. But even with regression adjustments and these things, it's still a problem when you go to higher and higher dimension. Okay, so this is all I wanted to show in this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.